Good afternoon. I'm Dan Cole, a professor of anesthesiology at uh, UCLA and the current president of the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation. And I want to thank the uh, Patient Safety Movement Foundation for hosting this uh, webinar, uh, the purposes of which is to highlight the upcoming Patient Safety Awareness Week that's going to occur next uh, month. We want to uh, raise awareness of patient safety and uh, develop this conversation to help stimulate the creation of safer healthcare systems. We have an exciting group of uh, panelists uh, to uh, discuss selected uh, patient safety topics, and I'll introduce uh, each one of them and then e give each one uh, the opportunity to make an opening statement about a topic that they consider of import. Uh, Sanos uh, Masumi, uh, she's the uh, Chief Operating Officer at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. Uh, Bernadette Wilson, she's a patient advocate, uh, Patient Safety Movement Foundation volunteer and founder of Cognitive Performance LLC, a professional coaching and team training firm. And then finally, uh, Brandon Lau is an Assistant Professor of Radiology and Associate Faculty in the Armstrong Institute for patient safety and quality. And with that, uh, let's go on to the uh, meat of the uh, uh, webinar. And I'll start with uh, Sanos uh, to maybe make a comment or two of things that she thinks important, maybe particularly in regards to raising awareness uh, and uh, particularly the safety culture. Thank you very much, Dr. Cole, for the kind introduction. Uh, well, at uh, the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, uh, we hope to be able to raise awareness around the topic of patient safety, to be able to create safer healthcare systems globally. We can't solve a problem if no one knows it exists. And overall, general public still believes that our healthcare system is a pretty safe environment and preventable patient harms is a very rare event. Well, we conducted a survey a few years back. Uh, we found that 88% of general public don't know the enormity of this issue. And yet, um, the estimates show and indicate that in US alone, uh, about 200,000 patients die every year from preventable adverse events, let alone those that they end up with uh, long-term disabilities and still the uh, harm reaches the patients. Around 400,000 preventable drug-related injuries occur each year in hospitals, 800,000 uh, in uh, long-term care settings, and over um, 500,000 of these drug uh, preventable drug-related injuries happen among Medicare recipients. So by just giving these few statistics, um, I think it is very obvious that this is a really big problem we are dealing with. Uh, and we um, know that the solutions are straightforward. We need to implement evidence-based practices. Thank you. Uh, Bernadette, uh, maybe you could give an opening uh, statement and maybe comment specifically on mental well-being and performance of teams and individuals. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Cole. You know, just listening to you, Santa, I was thinking about um, so much how this is a human problem. It's a, a global problem. It's not just a hospital problem because it affects everybody internally and externally of the healthcare system. I think the problem um, in the way of like a Rubik's cube, you have a cube and maybe you get it and it's in a perfect form and there's uh, some colors and there's a system to it. But if you mix it up, there's a lot of angles and dimensions to solving this problem. And patient safety is the same way. We have to kind of look at it from internally within the organization, what is going on operationally, and what type of culture. And I think that was something we spoke about earlier, about the culture of the organization and how we can implement more compassion and awareness for our healthcare workers. I know one of our facilities here does a, a code lavender, which I absolutely love. So if there is a medical harm, people surround the person that may be the medical per person that was involved with that and offer them support because as a person becomes um, full of stress, anxiety, we all lock down. And if a whole team is that way around a medical harm or error or any type of high stress environment, more errors will 
continue and more damage to a, another person can um, happen. So that's more internally and externally. It's more of what you also said is that awareness and bringing that awareness. Me as a patient advocate, when I speak to people, they don't even know that there is a harm. If there is something, I said, you know, that is a medical harm. And they don't understand that and realize that. So just getting the clarification of what a medical harm is and then getting people to talk about it and tell stories because it really does affect the whole family, our whole community. Um, and, and, and as, as we see now, um, you know, with the, what's happened in the past, uh, with COVID, um, it affects us globally. Uh, Brandon, do you want to uh, give us an opening statement and maybe even, uh, interwind, uh, COVID and how that may have affected, uh, the patient safety movement? Yeah, you know, thank you very much for the introduction. And I, I completely agree. I think that. COVID, it has been unlike anything that we've ever experienced in our, our lifetimes. And leading up to that, we've developed and, and implemented various interventions to try to improve quality, improve safety in healthcare organizations. And when COVID came around, you know, it, it pretty much changed a lot of the culture of our day-to-day -day practices. Uh, and we were forced to modify how it is that we were approaching healthcare delivery, uh, trying to do the best for uh, the patients who were, were coming into the hospital. And I think that it, it created a bit of a, a challenge to ongoing healthcare quality improvement um, and identifying opportunities for safety. And as we're emerging from the pandemic, we're realizing that a lot of the culture in, in healthcare and practices are probably different now than before the pandemic began. And we have to take a really good look at where, where our numbers are, where our opportunities to improve are, and try to figure out how we can try to modify solutions and, and interventions that have worked before uh, for the, the culture and practice that, that we have now. And while I don't think it's completely starting over in the world of, of healthcare quality improvement and patient safety, I think that we need to really have a clear understanding of what the data tells us are our opportunities to improve and what our healthcare practices are now so that we can really uh, pick up and drive that momentum that we had before uh, to ensure that patients are getting the, the best, safest care uh, in in healthcare, let me just bridge to from that uh, to another area of uh, concern. That would be the um, healthcare workforce, and uh, particularly there's been uh, predictions of, of a mass exodus of uh, people from the workforce. I think there was a recent double AMC uh, uh, survey that came out that said. Uh, 47% of physicians are 55 or older, and um, COVID certainly has affected uh, burnout and uh, distress within the healthcare uh, workforce. And I know that uh, the workforce has been uh, stated as probably the top uh, patient safety issue uh, going forward. Uh, I wonder if uh, you'd like to maybe comment on how we might address uh, the, uh, the workforce issues. I think I think workforce is absolutely critical to the culture of healthcare safety. Um, one of the things that we're also noticing is uh, an increased use of traveling nurses, and nurses are some of the the first healthcare workers who will see issues arise. And one of the very interesting things that we saw beforehand is that the teams of of nurses who would work together day in, day out, understanding, developing, implementing practices to keep patients safe in hospitals because they are, they're a team, they're a family, they're people who work together all the time. And while I have absolutely the greatest respect for, for nurses and, and all of the work that they do, I think it is a different culture when there's a, 
uh, a large number of traveling nurses who may be in one environment for a very short period of time and probably a different level of engagement of uh, safety culture and innovation for what might work on individual hospital floors or within, within departments uh, to identify where there are opportunities to, to try to keep patients safe. And I think that it's really important as we're thinking about the workforce and, and rebuilding the workforce and re-energizing the workforce to think about how we can do better in team building between clinicians of different disciplines and also recapturing that feeling of all being in this together and all having a vision for how we can improve uh, the safety, quality, and experience of the patients while they're in the hospital. Maybe we can jump to uh, Bernadette and uh, considering kind of a fragmented and very fragile uh, workforce that is becoming more and more stressed with the demands of uh, healthcare by the United States population. Uh, any comments on things that we can start to do uh, to sustain, improve the mental well-being of uh, the uh, workforce and uh, also the performance of the teams? Okay, uh, a couple thoughts there and, and just backing up on the previous conversation as well. Um, I'm thinking that we need, did I freeze? <laughs> I'll continue speaking. Mm -hmm. Um, that we need to continue with the training. And I was thinking about the nursing schools, local nursing schools, making the patient safety culture priority number one. It just has to be the main core value. And I think, Dr. Cole, you know this, I think, believe the medical creed is do no harm. So making that, coming back to that, and that is number one. So if you have that as the upper message going through any healthcare system you go into, there'll be less confusion. Then you look at the individual teams, you can implement down the line compassionate care principles of uh, being able to take, allowing um, healthcare workers to take time out, to have morning huddles, to discuss the stresses of the day. They, they, they should just be standard operating procedure. Um, I always uh, believe that there should be an operational manual, a, a safety uh, operational manual that goes with any facility and that there is a team that really monitors this and oversees this and making sure that these protocols are followed. Um, and one of the biggest things that I tell my clients when I'm working with them and I'm going into an environment is really to understand that they are in a high stress world, high stress environment. So it's very, very important to take what we say called mini breaks to really stop, breathe, relax, and refocus. So, uh, Sanos, uh, any comments on that issue before I ask you a specific question? I uh, just wanted to briefly talk about um, the data transparency and how it ties to the workforce. Um, I'm sure many clinicians um, and clinical team members still work in healthcare organizations where if there is an adverse event in one department, they are not going to necessarily be informed about it. And these lessons learned are not shared throughout the organization, let alone outside and in a global fashion. Um, so many individuals happen to experience the same um, errors, the same failures and the same patient harms that has happened in the past numerous times and they could have been prevented. And uh, along with the patient who we are trying to protect, we're also trying to protect our healthcare workers from having to deal with an experience, this, the trauma. The trauma is uh, widespread. The patient is obviously the recipient of it, but healthcare workers also um, are the other end of the spectrum receiving the trauma. Um, and uh, th that's why I think data transparency, or I should better say the lack of transparency in the current healthcare situation is one of the important topics we have to address and we have to talk about it um, um, to start um, moving the needle towards safer healthcare system. 
And let me follow up a question uh, in regards to your opening uh, comments, Santos. Um, you mentioned uh, some stunning figures about uh, the death, morbidity uh, of preventable harm, uh, which would actually make uh, preventable harm the third or fourth most uh, common cause of death in the United States. That's right. Um, why hasn't patient safety received greater profile and great attention uh, on par with uh, cancer and cardiovascular diseases? That's a really good point. And I think, again, it goes back to uh, one, to um, not having transparent data. So when we talk about these figures, like 200,000 pe people dying every day in the um, US annually, more getting harm due to medication errors and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, up to this point, we didn't have really good data collection processes. So we don't know the exact number of harm. We don't know exactly when they are happening, where they are happening. So connecting the, we haven't been able to connect the dots yet for the same purpose. The other topic I want to bring to the picture is aligned incentives. It has started, we have started to pay our providers more for the quality of the care they provide rather than the quantity of the care. But still, if you look at this globally, um, major, in majority of the cases, Providers are paid based on the quantity of care, based on the number of procedures they do, based on the number of patients they see on a daily basis. Until we fix the aligned incentives and data transparency and join it with incorporating gold standard of care, we continue to see the same um, uh, number of uh, patient harms. Um, and perhaps that's one of the reasons why patient safety hasn't received in the past decade, maybe hasn't received as much um, light at, as cancer interventions because they have a lot better uh, methods of collecting data, a lot better interventions to put an end to many of the cancers. Uh, Brandon or Bernadette, any comments? I I completely agree when, when it comes, as a data scientist, I completely agree that you know, we we woefully underutilize the data that we have uh, to try to better understand what the opportunities to improve care are, and and I think that that is uh, just an absolute travesty in in healthcare. I think that challenges come in in multiple different ways in in this, and one is uh, that there isn't really a great standardized definition or measure that hospitals are consistently holding themselves accountable to. Mm -hmm. So in, in one area, one of my main um, uh, clinical topics is uh, diagnosis, prevention, and treatment of blood clots, venous thromboembolism. And it's a measure of outcome and processes to prevent blood clots that's used by multiple different organizations throughout the world and all of their definitions, inclusion, exclusion criteria, what qualifies as preventable, uh, a preventable blood clot versus an inevitable blood clot, they're all different criteria. So hospitals are holding themselves accountable to a variety of different measures, mm -hmm. many of which don't actually make clinical sense or give actionable opportunities for improvement. So I do think that one of the key issues is having a consistent defined measure that hospitals are able to readily access their data and say this is what our outcome is or this is what our our safety number is across multiple different domains and the second area that that ties into data also comes to the electronic health record system even when you have the same electronic health record system, a lot of the ways that they get built and implemented at individual hospitals varies slightly. So as one example of this, we have a project right now that has been demonstrated to improve administration of medications to prevent blood clots 
um, within our own health system that we have attempted to share with 10 other hospitals uh, around the country using the same electronic health record system that we have. We've shared our code for building uh, reports, for, for building the, the tool that helps to, to facilitate this intervention. And in every case, that code has had to be modified based on their electronic health record system build. So it's not even as easy to just simply share uh, an intervention that works at one hospital with a bunch of other hospitals thinking that it's a plug and play system. And I think that as, as a country, we need to do better at leveraging the incredible investment that we've put into adopting electronic health record systems to make data both transparent and easily reportable, but also facilitate uh, intervention implementation. When we see that something works at one hospital or five hospitals, how can we spread it out to the thousands of other hospitals uh, that could potentially benefit from that, that type of intervention? Maybe a question for uh, Bernadette to kind of build on that. Um, as you know, many surveys in the recent years have shown that patient trust, the public trust in healthcare systems and uh, doctors has plummeted. Uh, I want to talk about rebuilding trust, uh, particularly through patient safety uh, and uh, engagement. How do we best get patients? patients a little more involved and engaged uh, in their actual care. Okay, great. Those are um, two great questions. You know, one gaining the trust and how to get patients involved. And just uh, backing up what Dr. Lau said, you know, I, I was thinking about how many reporting avenues are out there now. You got the U.S. News and you got Visivant and you have all these different measurement types. And so the consumer is going to be looking at those types. They're going to be looking at those ratings to see which is the best hospital. They may not be providing the best care, but they're going to be looking there. And then that may, may or may not lead to some mistrust, um, depending on how the reporting was done. Um, and the uh, statistics were reported. So the, the trust comes from honesty and transparency. If a consumer could go to a website or a patient goes to a website and actually see what their ratings are, how well they do in a certain procedure, how well they've reduced CLABSI, how safe is that hospital, that would help tremendously. I also encourage patients to go and ask questions and be extremely vigilant about their care. You have to assume that this is your care, your um, uh, your well-being and your caretakers as well. So it's kind of a team effort. And on the other end, that have um, for whatever the physician prescribes to follow that. Often patients won't follow the advice of the um, physician and they may have readmission, which also causes more harm to individuals. So the understanding that the physician's advice is most sage most of the time, I mean, it's right to question it, to always question it. And also there are books out there and there's material out there that there's checklists that people can bring into their doctor's office and talk to them about what is going to happen with anesthesia? Who's going to be my anesthesiologist? Is somebody going to be ma monitoring my anesthesiology? And and just really work so, so often, I know this has happened to me before, you just sign the form and you leave and you don't know what's going on. So to have that awareness will reduce the anxiety and I think it reduces it as a team. And the healthcare professionals and the patients should be a team in their collaboration. Um, and I know it's it's kind of a big ask because physicians are extremely busy and healthcare workers are extremely busy. And on the other side, each person wants to be treated as if they're the only one. So the merging of that coming together is the, the human part. And we really, again, just have to slow down um, to provide good care and for patients to become more aware. Uh, Sanos, any comments on that? Uh, yes, I just wanted to mention that um, I fully agree with what Bernd just mentioned, that 
uh, in healthcare is a really fast-paced environment. It's really dynamic. A lot of decisions are being made concurrently. Um, so I think that if we master the science of safety in healthcare, like how other uh, industries such as aviation or nuclear have done it, we have a better chance of serving our patients and serving our healthcare workers um, in a more holistic view. And there are, like, I think there are three basic ingredients in creating a safe culture. If we have a reporting system to help start with um, conducting a root cause analysis when a failure happens. If we have and promote a learning atmosphere, which turns the errors into lessons learned rather than a blame culture. And if we have a systematic assessment of a culture on a continuous base, it, these three together at least give us a foundation to start build um, a culture of safety where people, both uh, patients and their family members and also clinicians, like the whole clinical team, feel comfortable to speak up and feel comfortable um, to sometimes stop a procedure, sometimes to bring something important uh, to the attention of uh, hospital administrators sooner than later. Um, I just wanted to add that point. So what, one last question for Brandon, and then I'll ask each of you to kind of make a closing statement. Um, Chat GPT has just uh, hit the field and you can get some amazing information off that. Not necessarily all of it's accurate, uh, but I can envision patients going to Chat GPT, getting a lot of information <laughs> that helps to level the asymmetry that occurs and chat GPT is only the first generation. How do, how do you envision tools like AI to help the patient become better engaged and help to prevent uh, safety events? Yeah, that's such a great and time, timely question. Um, I think that as we're learning more and more about how to harness artificial intelligence, machine learning, natural language processing, on, on both sides as, as clinicians, researchers, patients. Um, I think that there's an incredible opportunity to, to learn from the past what would potentially take a lifetime of sifting through documents, thousands, tens of thousands of, of free text documents of things that have been documented to try to understand where things might have gone wrong and identify um, potential uh, interventions to prevent that from happening in the future. I think that there's incredible potential for it. I think one of the concerns for it is that you have to consider the quality of the information going into it. And usually the, the output that you get from that is only as good as your inputs. And if there are some questionable documentation practices, um, if there's a lot of variability in the way that people describe uh, specific events happening or the way that things lead up to, to various events, it can actually heavily influence the results that you're going to get from it. I think that it, there's enormous potential for it. I think that we just have to be a little careful of how much stock we're putting in it right at this moment versus continuing to optimize it over the course of time uh, to make sure that we're getting really high quality information out of it. So we have about three or four minutes uh, left. Uh, with that, um, I think I'll ask each of you to maybe give a one minute uh, kind of closing statement of where you'd like to see us go. I'll start with Bernadette. Thank you, and I apologize if my screen has um, frozen one more time. Um, I believe it's it's with the organization, it's the organizational values, implementing the patient safety culture first, and that's just globally with our educational system, uh, healthcare educational system, and within the healthcare system environment, and then also using um, compassion and really being aware of what is going on with your own personal health care and when you are going into a hospital and speaking up and taking sole responsibility for your health care, knowing that it is your right to do so. And then also understand that the majority, just about all of the healthcare workers are there to support you and they are also human too and they're overstressed. So be, it's okay to ask questions 
and as team members, it's okay to slow down and really speak to each other and talk about what is happening. And if you see somebody, one of your um, coworkers in a stressful state of mind or have anxiety, to slow them down, take a breath, breathe, take a break and come back to it. Because again, that's how errors occur. Uh, Brandon, a minute. You know, for me, and I go back to being uh, uh, in, in data science, for me, healthcare quality improvement and safety improvement is, is really going to be based in the data and understanding where the opportunities to improve are. I think that transparency is absolutely essential. We need to make use of this enormous body of data that we have um, to really make sense of it, transform it into information using a standardized measure across hospitals, across health systems, so that we can really compare uh, hospitals to one another in a standardized way, and then be able to drill down to individual practices and processes that we can give actionable information to individuals, be it physicians, nurses, patients, from all of the data that we're collecting to really empower people with information to change the culture and change the practice uh, to make it higher quality and safer. Uh, Thanos, any closing comments? Thank you. Just wanted to say that uh, at some point in life, we will all experience what it is like to be a patient. So if you're informed, we can become our own patient advocates. And we'd like our patients to team up with our clinical team in creating a safer healthcare system because we are all in it together. Well, thank you all. I want to specifically uh, thank uh, Bernadette, Brandon, and Santos for a very stimulating and enlightening uh, panel uh, today. And uh, also thank the uh, Patient Safety Movement Foundation for hosting this conference. And with that, uh, we will say goodbye. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you.